she received a request from a board member to take an item on the agenda out of order. Copies of the agenda and related documents are available for you uh, on the table located again on my left. Should any board member have a conflict of interest at the time the agenda item is announced for discussion, the board member should identify the general nature of the conflict, indicate that he or she is recusing him or herself from participating in the matter of legal meeting information and discussion of the agenda item. Before we make a decision on any item, the public is provided with the opportunity to provide a comment on the item that we are considering. If you have a general comment on an item that is not listed on the agenda, then you may provide us with your comment during the public comment portion of the meeting. Please understand that there are certain laws that apply to all the actions that we take during tonight's meeting. Thus, we may be legally prohibited from acting on a concern that you express. However, please note that your concern may become a topic of discussion in a future meeting before our board after we've had a chance to list the item on the agenda. Please fill out a speaker card so that you may be heard on any agenda item. You will be called by me or by Karen Macker, President, when she arrives, when it is your turn to speak. Please be sure to place the number of the item you wish to speak about on the card. Copies of the speaker cards are located on the table to my left. Um, please hand the speaker card to Mr. Holly, who is on, on our left. When a person is speaking, they are entitled to courtesy and respect. Please refrain from any other discussion in the room. If you wish to chat, then please take that discussion outside of the meeting as a session. We treat one another with respect. That means we have possibility of accord. Competing viewpoints may be articulated without the need for, for inappropriate or uncivil action. Last but not least, please switch your phone ringers, your cell phone ringers, to vibrate or silent. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you tonight. Um, so, Mr. Hardy, can you take the roll, please? Commissioner Here. Commissioner Schaefer? Here. Commissioner Atkinson? Here. Commissioner Lydia Grant? Here. Commissioner Whitman? Here. Commissioner Medina? Here. And Commissioner Rubio is not here at the present, but we have four. Thank you. Uh, now we'll uh, approve the minutes from our last meeting. Um, do I have a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes as written. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you. I'll abstain. I wasn't there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a yes. I, I understand that. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so we'll move on to general public comments. And uh, let's see, looks like I have three speaker cards for number four. So, Sean Gannett. Yeah, go to the, we need to find you, so. My first one of the ever, so. Welcome, thank, thank you, you for coming. Much. Appreciate your having us and listening to me. Uh, so my name is Sean Gannon. I'm a Mar Vista stakeholder, uh, Region 11. And uh, this is about the, the voting issues that we've had kind of around the west side anyway. Um, so I went online and saw who my completely unopposed people were that were running in my neighborhood. I thought, well, you know, I wanted to start getting involved. So, uh, so I showed up to vote. And I found there were seven people on the ballot that, oh, I didn't memorize any names or anything. So I asked the people running the election, weren't there only six people? They said, oh yeah, and they pointed to the thing. Oh yeah, he withdrew. But it seems like we're not doing like Inca votes with millions of ballots, so it seemed to make sense that anyone who's withdrawn from the race shouldn't be on the ballot, or should at least be crossed off. Because I think it's kind of unfair to the others. Um, so, this is also a factor in a race involving my friend Allison, uh, Allison Regan, who was running in Palms. And uh, we helped canvas, a bunch of us friends got together and walked up and down the street and we passed out flyers and stuff. And she was told after the election that she had won. She had eight votes, the, unopposed, the candidate that was not running got six, and her opponent got three. Then she was told on Friday, 
Actually, there was a recount. He lost by one vote, 15-14. So Allison will talk about some of the issues. But there were four conditions for a recount. None of them were observed. Um, so you know, I was asking about, because I looked online to see the canvas of votes. And it was 14 to 14, but the other withdrawn candidate had won, and that ended up in her opponent's call. So I asked, well, what, what's this about? And the head of the Palms elections told Allison that Palms has its own set of voting rules, its bylaws, and they call for instant runoff voting. But the problem with instant runoff voting is it doesn't work for races with two people. It's designed for you to choose your first, second, third, fourth, and sixth choice, and then if there's not a plurality in that, the last place candidate, their second place choices go, and so on and so forth. So you end up with a plurality. But with two candidates, it should just be you vote for one candidate or the other. And if there's a tie, there's supposed to be a drawing of straws. And that didn't happen, allegedly, because of these pilots. Um, and in another race, there were 32 votes for an unopposed candidate. And after a recount, even though three people signed off on it, he ended up with five votes. And in another race, well, in Allison's race, there were 29 ballots cast. On first count, 17 votes actually counted. So as a stakeholder and someone who's never participated before, it's bothersome to me that, you know, I want to spend hours trying to help my community and help my friends help their community. But it's kind of hard to when these kinds of fairly egregious things are going on with the election. So I'm wondering what steps will be taken. And since I've never done this before, I don't know if that's something that's discussed tonight or if that will be, it sounded like that will be discussed possibly at future meetings. But just as someone who's new to the process and kind of wants to help out, it's kind of dispiriting to see these kinds of issues. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we uh, have quite a few speaker cards, so I'm going to ask you to keep your comments to the allotted um, time. Um, Scott Johnson. Yeah, when you hear the when you hear the beeping, that means your time is up. Good evening, commissioners, general manager, department employees, and community members. I'm all about I'm all around LA. I'd like to gather already from the first comment. I want to welcome you to LA 32 as a stakeholder and former LA 32 neighborhood council member. I'm glad to see the commission take the step to come to our community to have this meeting here tonight. And in judging from the agenda, we are going to have a dialogue on various issues affecting the neighborhood council. And this is a great first step. I also want to take the time to commend the President, Ms. Mack, on her conduction of the last meeting I went to at City Hall. It's an exception nowadays to find a chair of the commission who takes the time to go beyond the allocated amount given to a speaker to listen to their viewpoint. And as a constituent, I greatly appreciate how you conducted yourself at the last meeting with the help of your fellow board members. It's important as a body that's Recognize that's here to empower neighborhoods to be strong, objective, and ethical community leaders to listen to the community. And this is a great first step tonight. We have a mix here of old board members and new board members. But I will take the time to note that after the previous election, we still have vacancies on the Ellington Community Council that should be filled by community members who would seek to empower themselves to better their community. And I will hope that the general manager, Ms. Gracie Lou, and the commissioners will endeavor to work with the LA32 community to fill a vacancy and to work with various entities within the department employees and also mentors with the council for council to create a sustainable, objective model of a working board that puts community first and self-interest last. Once again, welcome to the community this evening. Welcome to our community, our home, and I look forward to the dialogue this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can we go up with Jacob? I 
do want to thank you. The last meeting you allowed me to go over time. Hopefully I don't do it this time. Um, one of the things that uh, had really been bothering me was at the last meeting, the general manager was asked specifically how LA32 could get off the exhaustive measures. And if I remember, all they needed to do was turn in a strategic plan. That was the answer. But here's where I, it kind of confused me at that point. Because if that was the reason why we were placed on exhaustive measures, we shouldn't have never been on exhaustive measures in the first place. And then I went back and I said, wait a minute. Several times, our members have asked, specifically from the gun employees, how do we get off with exhaustive measures? First of all, what is the violation? And then I went back and said, how come we can't get an answer from our gun reps? And then I looked at this 217-page report from the city attorney's office, and it says complaints against the certified neighborhood councils. Complaints against the certified neighborhood council of any nature shall be filled with done on a prescribed form by done. A copy of the complaint shall be delivered by done to the affected certified neighborhood council against which the complaint is made within five days of receipt of the complaint. We never got that. Exhaustive efforts to remedy all complaints shall be taken by done. No plan was ever put together. In the case where the complaint is in regards to a violation of this plan and a remedy cannot be reached, the process prescribed in Article 6, Section 5 shall be the following. Involuntary decertification. Either this means something or forget it. We are going to be dictated from now on by done. And what I keep saying to people is the public servant just like us, we are servants. We are not dictators in this country. And the department cannot be allowed to do these things without having to follow the law themselves. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening, Gracie. My name is Anthony Manzano, and I participated here on the Neighborhood Council Structure and uh, Stakeholder, President, Vice President, and Treasurer uh, since October of 2004. I bring that up because I have a calendar here from May of 2014, so that puts us about four months, maybe five months out from serving, not only as a board member, but as a stakeholder for 10 years. And I've seen the progress, the development, the benefits of having the Neighborhood Council serving the stakeholders but I've also seen some of the drawbacks. And today I'm here to inform you guys as you heard some of the previous board members expressing today some concerns regarding our elections. Um, in our bylaws, it indicates that our board must be comprised of 21 stakeholders, uh, elected, selected, or comprised or appointed by the board. I have uh, petition signatures that I submitted there at my table that I will probably be handing to you that I forgot to bring to the podium of over 70 stakeholders requesting for the seats to be filled. And as our bylaws, it indicates that this must be agendized and that the board will vote to fill the vacancies. Under exhaustive efforts, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment is using the, the I would call it an excuse, uh, EE, everyday excuses, that exhaustive efforts allows them to create our agenda, but at the same time, they're disenfranchising the public because the public is asking for an item to be on the agenda, and that item is to fill our vacancies. It's very simple. We have a neighboring neighborhood council, a Royal Cycle Neighborhood Council, a uh, little bit to our north, who also has 21 seats and they fill their vacancies. We should be allowed to be permitted to have the same uh, principles guided here. I have three grievances that I prepared. One is uh, the violation of not filling the vacancies for our bylaws. One is for not listening to the stakeholders and uh, uh, signing this on the agenda item. And the third one is for a violation of the Brown Act. We recently had an executive committee meeting uh, about a week ago, and in our bylaws it says that there should be five postings. I recently understand that the commissioner has indicated that we, bare minimum, at least one posting. But you know what? The executive committee didn't even do that. Not even one official posting, because what they did is they put it inside the library, and I went and checked it at 11 o'clock at night. Couldn't read it. It was locked inside. Three schools, they claim. Well, no problem. The schools are closed at around 5 or 6 o'clock. If anybody wants to enter a school right now, can't do it. So you can't view the agenda. The last location, they said, was right out here. And I would say that they didn't even post it. They're just saying they did, because I came to verify. There was no posting outside. So then they refer back to the to the website. And that's why I brought that up earlier. The website says that the meeting was going to be held that Wednesday. That's correct. But at 7 p.m. on the official LA32 Neighborhood Council website. You go to the agenda, 
The agenda was held at 6 o'clock. So if you show up at 7 o'clock, just like the website says, then you missed the meeting. And I don't want to miss the meeting, so I'm the stakeholder, I'm here to participate. So obviously all actions taken at that executive committee meeting, which is right here, I have the agenda with my notes on it, was held at 6 o'clock and nobody knew about it. My name is Anthony Manzano, I'll be speaking to you a couple more times a little bit later. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, and welcome to the neighborhood. Glad to have you out here. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, yeah, the exhaustive efforts was um, egregious and unwarranted. That's not why I'm here to speak before you. Uh, I want to pick up on the filling of the seats. After our elections, we had three vacant seats uh, available to be filled, and our bylaws specified to fill those seats. Now, our understanding from uh, the Department of Neighborhood uh, Empowerment is that we need to review our bylaws before we fill those seats. Well, the bylaws committee can go on for months and months, and they can come back and say, well, we, we, we continue to support the 21 seat uh, capacity. Uh, but barring that, we still have bylaws that we need to operate by, and not suggestions and recommendations from Dunn as to changing the bylaws. So we really need to fill those seats. We're in a sort of a uh, limbo area here, a quandary, uh, by not having those seats filled. I've already gotten a word from one individual, if not two or three, that they're probably not interested in filling those seats. So I think we ought to do that now while we do have the members to make that as easy as possible, having those vacant seats filled. Um, I haven't heard really that much from the neighborhood council. I, I wish the president's here, hopefully she'll get up in and speak to addressing uh, the stakeholders. After all, it's the stakeholders on Eastern Avenue, where the bread is buttered. It's not by Dunn on Spring Street. So I think we're really, it is an issue we're having here. We need to address it uh, post haste and uh, have those, all of our bylaws, and let's have those seats filled. If the, if the commission or the, the committee comes back and elects to go ahead and reduce those seats, well, that's fine. That's another issue. And we can talk about it at the time. Um, We've had quorums uh, in our last uh, uh, constituted board. In the majority of our meetings, yeah, we've had people quit. They quit for whatever reasons. Um, but we always maintain quorum at our meetings. And uh, once again, uh, thank you for being here. And hopefully you'll make note of the comments that are made by myself and others regarding the building of seats. Thanks again. Thank you. Dr. Tom Williams. Dr. Tom Williams, house here, uh, also a 30 year owner occupant of El Cerrito. Long time interest in it. We have a lot of problems, but compared to every other city in California and almost the United States, it's a lot better than they have. So I always tell the city council, where else can you get 100 groups of more than 10 people wasting using their time four hours a month free? All of these things is a collision between paid staff versus volunteers. I've seen it in many organizations. We have a problem. How can we fix it? I don't know. It may be there will be a hundred different fixes. It should be allowed to reflect the community in which it is resident, the stakeholders. How to get more stakeholders out? I would suggest that we need to also have a commission panel for discussion with at least one representative of every council district because today in Plum, unknown to LA 32, the Berkshire area, which is in the north portion of LA 32 Neighborhood Council, was up for oh, historic preservation ordinance zoning. 
Oh, have any community impact statement been prepared? No. How can you get a community impact statement when you get three days notice? Eh, seven days notice. And it takes about two months to get it through the neighborhood councils? Yes. Give latitude, but also make sure that the council districts, the commission, and the neighborhood councils give respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Mack and uh, Board of Member Commissioners. I actually just want to save my comments for item number seven, so I apologize for submitting uh, that comment card in there. Linda McGuire. Committee, and I'm a member of that committee as a stakeholder. And at our first meeting, 
um, from the four committee members that were present, three of them were in favor of decreasing our board. Okay, now we're gonna, be, we're gonna take input from residents, from our stakeholders, but just to let you know right now, um, we are in favor of decreasing the board. Um, so as far as filling those vacancies, I, I'm, I don't see the need to fill those vacancies. The people who have spoken before me wanting to, de to fill those vacancies are not even people, stakeholders of the South region, which have three vacancies. So if, for whatever reason, if the board moves forward with filling those vacancies, I would like those vacancies to be filled by South region stakeholders so they could be, um, South region could truly be represented by residents or workers from that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marlene Fonseca. Good evening, Commissioners, General Manager um, Gracie Lee. Um, I'm Marlene Fonseca. I'm the newly elected president for LA32. And I do want to apologize. I wasn't planning on being here. Taking dinner and getting ready to go run. So that's why I'm in my clothes right now. However, congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So after hearing some of the speakers, um, I'm not here to address everything they're saying. I'm not going to comment on Mr. Monsano's grievance regarding the executive committee. Um, I don't believe this is the channel for that. I'll let that go through the proper process. If it is deemed grievable, then the process will be followed, I'm sure. Regarding the LA32 vacancies, um, I believe there was a comment made that I have not um, addressed the stakeholders in regards to this. I do want to just inform everybody, including the commissioners and the stakeholders, that myself and the current new board have inherited um, a neighborhood council that is in exhaustive efforts, as obviously we all know. Um, I obviously am not the determining factor on how things are handled from here on out. Um, I may have a personal opinion on whether or not these seats, these seats shall be filled, but again, that's not the determining factor either. I feel like my role at this point is to serve the community best, which would be to get this neighborhood council out of exhaustive efforts, and that would entail doing whatever criteria the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment sets forth, and that's what I'm focusing on and concentrating on. Um, I believe that there may be um, different interpretations of the bylaws that definitely need clarification um, as far as filling the seats. There's no time frame listed. I'm not opposed to filling the seats. I would like the, the stakeholders to have a say in whether or not they feel that the seats should be filled. But again, I don't control the agenda right now. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get the, um, the funds unfrozen for our community because I believe that is the purpose of the Neighborhood Council is to serve the community and provide them with services, funding, and everything else. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Corzantes. Good evening. My name is Michelle Corzantes, and I am the LA32 President um, Treasurer. And um, on May 7, when Doug was here doing the training, they did help us, and they did assist us, and they did explain on the exhausted efforts. And exhausted efforts has to do because they didn't get along. So we have to move out of exhausted efforts in order to do this. We need uh, support from the former board, who has not been very supportive as far as making the transition smoothly. Former treasurer, former recording secretary having given us the things we need as far as books, files, inventory, uh, bank statements, inventory list, up in the air. Public storage, couldn't get a key. And these people are the same ones that want to fill the seats. These people are the same ones that want to fill in the seats, but that can't things that we have to really work as a team, and the team that we are today, the executive board that we are today, we are really getting along good. We have been uh, working together. We are all understanding of the former board and their grievance and their concerns. But sometimes there has to be change, because with change 
things happen, good things happen. The board is running fine with the number that it has right now. And the board is doing great working as a team. And we are trying everything we can. Lizette is walking us through to getting us out of exhausted efforts. She's gonna make sure that we are able to purchase things for operation. She's going to make sure we get that accessible for the P card so we can use it by June 13th. She's doing all of this with us, working with us. But sometimes we understand that some former board members who are now stakeholders cannot accept that change. They hold the seat for years and years and they don't allow the new people who've never ever done this kind of work to get our you know, hands in there and try it for the new stakeholders, for the new people that are looking at us. You know, our meetings are empty because people say, oh my God, here they go again, you know? And it is our job to make sure that more people come. The outreach committee is gonna be outstanding. We're gonna try everything to make our meetings be full of people here so they can get more involved. You know, I've been through Huntington talking to some business people, to some stakeholders, and a lot of them are not happy with what the former board has done. They, they're not, and they, they know my names, and we all know who they are, because you continue seeing them not only here, but at every other meeting with their concerns, with their grievance, and so forth. So the only thing I can say is that you just continue to think about us and help us when we come to you, because we are a, an executive board that does reach out. We do reach out all the time, and we don't stop calling in Power LA. We're like that. We look up to the Power LA because they're there to give us that guidance. That's how we see a Power LA. Thank you. Thank you. So I had a suggestion from our number one stakeholder, Commission Development Stakeholder, to call people up um, together so that, because this is kind of a big room, so let's give that a shot. Um, Allison Reagan, and then Maria Miranda. Sharon Christie. Commission President Karen, um, just to, for the record, that Commissioner Rubio has joined us. that they can conduct similar secret recounts on their own initiative. 
So I'm here because Mr. Vox has the head of elections. He's the head of a system in which the public must have confidence in order to increase public participation. And even the appearance of impropriety erodes that confidence. So I'm hopeful that the commission will investigate uh, what has happened and put policies and procedures in place to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, Miranda. Hi. Hi. My name is Maria Miranda. Um, I'm a stakeholder. Um, I was uh, recently on the board, um, the previous term. I got uh, voted in maybe um, six months. I served on the board. And then I, I, I tried again to be reelected. I was not. Um, I received that. I accepted that. Um, why I'm here today and what I want I want to express is um, everything that, that I have heard. I've been here not the whole meeting, but from what I've heard and what I've seen that's going on, um, you know, they, they're talking about a lot of change, change, change. Now, I'm not against change. I love change and sometimes it could be a beneficial, but a lot of times when everybody, when there's so much, um, there's so much, uh, how can I say, um, there's so much new things that you have to learn first what is there before you change. You have to learn what the policies, procedures, um, et cetera, are before you change. Last, uh, last meeting I was there, um, they're talking about uh, the board uh, being uh, very fit and everything's going on fine. There was four people in attendance at the meeting. If there's so much change, why were there only four people there at the meeting? Why weren't there 20 or 50 or 60 people? Um, this to me is telling me um, we need to overlook and we need to oversee what is really actually happening. Um, my, um, like I said, I was there, I served very shortly on the board. I did not get to, to get my, my, I didn't get, a, get to get a feeling of anything. I was just, uh, it just seemed as though this was against that, this was against that. And, um, what I want to see in our board is change. Yes, change, but for the stakeholders, for the people, not for the benefit of, of who is serving on the board or, or for people's uh, own, own good. Or I want to see change for the community. I want to see more people in attendance at our meeting. I want to see stakeholders there. I want to see more community involvement. And this is, like I said, the first meeting that we had, I went and there was maybe six, six people, maybe six people. And that to me is showing that there's no change. So I ask you, as you look and you see, look at what the policies are, what, what LA32, what, what, what everything but everything that, that is there in, in our bylaws are there for a reason. Stick to the bylaws, not change, change, change. We have to first stick to what, what is there and what is realistic in order to change. Fix what you have, not just go and change things. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to tell you, but... Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I can tell this. Means a lot to you. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon Christie. Good evening um, to the Commissioner of Councils and the City officials. Um, I apologize for walking in late. Um, I recommend to everybody do not listen to Siri on the iPad for erection. That's number one. Um, I am brand new to uh, the Neighborhood Council. I ran for office um, for South Park Bay in the Pico Neighborhood Council. I won. I won by one vote. 
in a total of seven. My entire Pico Neighborhood Council had 74 votes. I was greatly surprised and knew that there was a challenge ahead of me and yet an opportunity. I have a slogan, don't forget to sing in the lifeboat. So I am happy to hear in the short time I have listened to three or four of the speakers come up, I am not alone in experiencing dysfunctionality. So this is a real conundrum that we're all faced with. And it has to do with human behavior. So one of my issues and the reason I'm here is access. I am one that you send me an email, you have it in two seconds. I have a telephone, I text, I email, I have an iPad, I have whatever it is technically I have. I'm on Facebook, like Twitter. Um, there is not a form of communication. I most prefer one-on-one -on -one with people and a phone conversation um, is second. So the access to the city is leaving something to be desired for we who are volunteers, and we take things very seriously because the nature of all of us that are volunteering, we want to do good, we do not want to fail, we want to help, and we really like to fix things. So what my mission is, is to really reduce the number of things we have to fix. So my last lady speaker, who was trying to express herself with change, um, I totally agree, you can't move forward um, until you understand what the past is. All too often, we have really experienced great street fighters, people that have been in the trenches. They may not necessarily know how to teach or how to transfer their knowledge. They should not be held in um, account for not being able to share that. So when I saw your draft about you know bullying and, and, and bad behavior, um, I right now am going through. Um, on can my I board. can I just stop you for a minute yes. just because the the time has gone. It sounds like you're going into the conversation about bullying behavior. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. what I'd like to suggest is, I don't know how long you're planning on staying, but we have another public comment period at the end of the meeting, mm -hmm. and so you could continue at that point. All right. I mean, I'll, I'll wrap this up. The basically, is we need more access to the people um, on the uh, councils and in the cities to be able to then do our jobs better. We need more training more availability of training. I feel due to uh, a few issues that have taken place. You know what, I'm really going to have to ask you to stop All right, and come, and, and come back because, I mean, we really want to hear from you. It sounds like you have a lot of ideas, but we need to... I have two more issues. One is on the funding. Yeah, okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our uh, public comment period. Um, uh, at this time, and we'll have another public comment period at the end of the meeting for those who um, have additional remarks. Um, number five is a, a verbal update from a representative of the office of the mayor. Um, I don't think there's anyone here tonight from the mayor's office, so we'll move on to number six, the general manager of the report. Hi, good evening, <coughs> commissioners and community members, Gracie Liu, General Manager for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, I want to share the very happy news today that uh, the checking accounts uh, contract was approved by City Council today, and, um, this morning, and that was massive. I did a little dance in chambers when that happened. Yeah, I'm wondering where the champagne is. Yeah. <laughs> it took a lot of work. Um, so we expect that the contract will be executed um, hopefully by early next week and neighbor councils will start uh, having their checking accounts open by next week. So um, it takes uh, 
us a few days to actually get their their debit cards out to folks and not every neighbor council has actually provided us with all of their information so we'll be tracking those folks down um but uh big thanks to to jeff Brill for helping uh, put the contract through um, and armando he's obviously been working on this and and uh, the uh, city attorney's office for for persevering um on these many months as we worked uh, with office of finance to to get this completed um, so the, the plan is to open, initially we we're going to open just a few, but since everyone on July 1st is going to the checking account system, we're just going to open every single one of them. Um, uh, yes, yay, I know. <laughs> um, and Wait, let's, let's give a round of applause. Many years, many years ago. So our goal, again, is to... Um, not only pay the, you'll understand the, the delicacy of this balance with my current funding team as we try to frantically pay out all of the demand warrants, over 200 demand warrants that we received, increase everyone's P card that has been asking for increases by the June 13th deadline so that they can pay for their uh, pur purchases on their P card, and then try to open the checking accounts and give them the rest of the money so that they have a few extra weeks <laughs> to, to spend down their funds. Um, that's that's going to be pretty challenging. So we are going to try to bring on some more temporary staff to assist us. So we have one team on um, opening all the accounts um, and getting all the necessary documentation, and then another team is finishing up the current fiscal year funding um, under the old system. So um, I'll be bringing updates on that. Uh, the other thing in terms of um, strategic plan and a new budgets, we will be releasing the new budget package this week to neighbor councils. Um, it will it include an outreach plan, um, the strategic plan, uh, request for rosters, and then the new um, board budget. Uh, again, we are trying to focus neighbor councils on strategic budgeting so that they can do strategic planning um, with their monies. What we ended up having happen again, which we tried uh, this past year to prevent with this first time asking for a strategic plan, is uh, most neighbor councils waited till the last month and a half to spend down their funds. So we, about a month and a half ago, out of the 3.5 million, we had 2.1 million remaining in the neighbor council funds. Uh, of unspent monies, and so you can imagine this wave of frantic spending that occurs um, at the end of the fiscal year. Um, I'm also hoping the, uh, be, with the checking accounts that that will, those few extra um, weeks of spending will will keep neighbor councils from you know doing this last minute frantic spend. Um, and for for the departments. Um, you may have heard we did receive uh, three unfunded positions for next fiscal year in our budget. One for policy and uh, two for outreach. Um, definitely wanted to uh, share my appreciation of, uh, of President uh, Karen Mack and, and Commissioner Schaefer for going and assisting and uh, asking for those positions and uh, advocating for those positions. Uh, they are unfunded, so the department will have some unused funds from this current fiscal year that we will request to move to next fiscal year to fund some of those positions. For the first time, we are also have been given the opportunity to request any unused neighbor council funds to fund those positions as well. Now, um, historically, neighbor councils have um, not spent about 300 to 500 thousand of their funds. Um, and again, this is uh, this be a chance to ask for it. You know, by giving them hopefully the checking accounts an extra opportunity to spend down their funds, they might actually not they might not actually have that much <laughs> to uh, left over. So, um, so we'll see at the end of the fiscal year. We're trying to um, we're trying to make it the cutoff for the fiscal year as close to the end of June as possible. Uh, before it used to be up to June 13th. Now we're going to try to push until um, the 30th. So um, again, that will hopefully give the neighbor councils an opportunity to spend down the funds. 
Um, in other operational matters, uh, the, the department's field team has been doing an excellent job. I'm actually going to turn this over to Joe, but we can talk about all the great trainings that they've been doing on one to one with the county. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Hari, Department of Labor and Empowerment. Uh, just, just briefly, we've been, we've been doing the trainings. Um, it's actually been a wonderful opportunity to go out there and, and, and see what neighborhood councils are doing. Um, you know, this was an idea that we came up with the department, I think, in January, and we scrambled quickly to, to you know, put our, our staff together to go out there and put, a, put the training together. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been going very well, and, and generally we've you know, gotten um, very positive reviews. You know, different neighborhood councils have different needs, and so some of them, you know, um, I, I, I think would like different emphasis on different areas, um, but but starting out this, this is an opportunity to really see and observe and, and, and train, um, you know, encouraging them to, to take the funding training, to take the ethics training so that they can um, they can start voting. So we're learning a lot and it's, and hopefully people are learning a lot from us as well. Um, we're also following up with the second meetings um, doing our best to, to get to those meetings. Um, you know, citywide, as you know, we have uh, six NEAs for the 95 neighborhood councils. One of the NEAs um, is still out on leave, so uh, we've been filling in. Um, and we've also been uh, councils for councils um, for those second meetings, the ones that we can't get to. We've been uh, scheduling them to, to go out and observe. So um, kind of racing around, but it feels like we're going past that hump, and um, we're looking forward to hopefully the, the good things that will come from this, from kind of front-loading the neighborhood councils in the sense of um, working with the issues at the very beginning so that hopefully there won't be other pitfalls that will come up as, as things, you know, there will always be issues and we'll always be there to support, but the more we can do proactively, the, the better. Um, and just to add to that, um, Olympic Park Neighborhood Council is no longer an exhaustive efforts, um, so that was wonderful. We worked with them and um, they started out, um, the reason, one of the major reasons why they did start in, in exhaustive efforts, why the department put them in exhaustive efforts was they had four candidates for 19 seats. By the time we worked with them, and, and they did a lot of work behind it, uh, we had 22 candidates. Um, and so we filled uh, most of their seats, and so it's a very positive kind of a partnership between the department and the neighborhood council. And really going into it, the department really looked at it as as a positive thing, as something that was providing extra support. So, you know, when you talk about exhaustive efforts, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, but hopefully it ends up being positive in the sense that, that we as a department can really support and help. And that's that's the, the purpose of it. Um, and, and hopefully people see that and with Olympic Park, it was, it was successful. MacArthur Park is still in exhaustive efforts, um, and they have been for a while. Um, but the reason they had a successful election, the reason that we're, we're continuing, we, we don't want to release them too soon. We want to give them all the support so that when we do release them, then they'll be ready to hit the ground running. So that's just an update on that. Thanks. And then lastly, in terms of neighbor council elections, we will be doing a debrief on June 9th, that's uh, next Monday, um, with uh, the community. There is a survey that will be going up for elections. Um, I, I do know the POMS issue, Maybe just briefly on that. POMS, uh, in their bylaws, they, they have, um, their candidates must win by 50% majority. Um, and so it, it's, um, it hasn't, they have an instant runoff voting uh, that's written into their bylaws, which we honored. We did do instant runoff voting for the last uh, election as well. And um, in this particular case, the count was not, for instant runoff voting, was not done correctly actually on the, in the unofficial canvas of votes. So um, I know that there's reference to a recount in the manual. Those are for, that recount process is for when stakeholders are um, asking for recounts themselves. But when we detect a uh, error in um, the count, we do have the ability to go in there and redo the count, which is what we did with um, Palms. And it resulted in a different outcome um, when the, it was the instant runoff voting was done correctly. Um, so next time around, 2016, we are hoping that we will have some aspect of online voting. And so we won't have to do manual recounts, which for some of the West Side neighborhood councils took 
many, many hours um, because they have some, some of them have you know, over a thousand voters. Um, with online voting, we'll be able to um, call up the, the vote instantaneously. So I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Can you say what's happening on June 9th? Is there a meeting? That's correct. There is a meeting. You can go to our Power LA um, events calendar. It's um, basically a debrief on the 2014 elections, what went right, what could have been done better um, in terms of helping us prepare for 2016. And there will be a, just a brief introduction about online voting and what that is and what that's, what that's going to look like. And where's that going to be? Um, I believe right now we have it in Hollywood. I'll double check. They were trying to lock down a location. Um, so I will, uh, but again, if you check our events calendar, but I'll email the commission. Oh, Steven's here. 1711 Van Ness. 1711 Van Ness. Hollywood and Van Ness. And Hollywood uh, and Van Ness. Ness. It's the church. Seventh right? Adventist Church. Seventh Adventist Church. Okay. Okay. Great. So, yeah, Seven? Seven. Yes. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for Jim and Blue? Commissioner Lippman? Yes, Commissioner Lippman. Um, first of all, Gracie, I want to thank you for pushing through the checking system. That was, when I came on the commission, that was the thing I was going to, that was my you know, driving push, but driving push, and I was at the Bel Air Beverly Cross Neighborhood Council two weeks ago. Um, and they were complaining bitterly about not being able to use their funds and how they were relatively smart people and were struggling with filling out the basic paperwork and getting a kickback. And I really hope that this new checking system, there's going to be its bumps, but it's going to really help to actually empower the neighborhood councils to do it. What I would recommend in the newsletter, <laughs> Stephen looks up, um, is that we recommend to neighborhood councils that they create an ad hoc committee um, for transition on the funding that the president and the treasurer and maybe another board member participate in that and kind of create some structure to actually do the transition because that's going to be, it is going to be a sort of a Herculean, Herculean effort. So that might be something you put in the newsletter as a recommendation along with what's happening. Um, and then I want to thank the NEAs for, thank you and the, the NEAs, if you can, Joe, for spending weekends and nights. I know Tom was with us on a Saturday morning, we fed him, so I maybe mean, appreciated that, but he's at another neighborhood council tonight in the west side, and so we do appreciate the, their time, because that is their time um, to come out and train, and, and it was a really good training. Um, you know, I, I would sort of, I don't really have a question, but I would recommend to the commissioners, and I've been getting a lot of the back and forth, that in addition to the June 9th um, meeting, that after we go through this town hall process with the board training that we have a town hall process on the elections um, and get more stakeholder commentary about the elections. And I, I do think, I mean, it's clear that there were some problems with the way that the election was administered and I want to be uh, responsive to that and see if there's policies that we can come up to not only make it a little bit easier for the department and all the volunteers for these 95 neighborhood councils who have very different rules um, create some consistency for elections, but also address some of these discrepancies that really disempower a lot of people, and that's exactly the opposite of what we want to see happen in our system. And so I think it is our obligation for us to hear people, and I'm glad people came out tonight, but also respond and, and do something. And I'm not going to say it's going to happen tomorrow. Let's get let's do this board training. But I think the idea of a town hall on elections and getting more stakeholder input and then coming up with some policy. Um, I, I'd be interested in leading that and I know it, uh, yeah, uh, others might be as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Medita, did you know where you No. Any other questions? I have a question about bylaws. Okay. Since you probably wrote it. <laughs> um, if there's an issue that's not addressed in neighborhood council bylaws, but it's also not addressed in the outline from the department, does it make it a mute point? And the issue is, it came up at one of our other meetings, uh, a gentleman um, from uh, Empowerment Congress Central asked, uh, can a married couple be on the board? And 
I was thinking that, well, if it's not addressed in the bylaws, forbid it, and if it's not in the bylaws outlined by the department, then it's a new point. And they could obviously be on the, they could obviously be on the board. But I didn't know if that was correct, so I didn't, you know. Yeah, there's um with that specific circumstance, yes, married couples can be on, and I don't. I think that even if they put in the bylaws that they couldn't, I, I don't know if that, that would even be able to, yeah, be, be legal. Um, what what I, what the department looks at is if they're married and they if it's a treasurer and second signatory, um, in terms of access to the funds, right. So we will look at that um, as a possible conflict of interest. Um, so. Actually, yeah, the department may be, uh, we actually might be bringing back um, uh, to the commission uh, some policy regarding bylaws in terms of some defaults uh, for things such as censure or removal if a neighborhood council doesn't take any action on it or, or fails to say anything about it. If they say we don't want it, that's one thing, but if they, if they just don't take any action and something happens, um, there, we, we would propose that there be some default language that we can rely on um, if the neighbor council gets into trouble. And um, really quickly, since Stephen is here, Stephen, did you want to talk briefly about what the outreach that we're going to be doing for neighbor councils and the tax information? Just sorry, didn't didn't bring that up. Um, Stephen and his team have been frantically trying to wrap up the end of the fiscal year by providing neighbor councils with some outreach um, information and uh, technology information. Thanks, Stephen Box with the department. He, uh, during the elections, we learned a great deal about all the different um, outreach strengths that different neighborhood councils have. And we saw a lot of neighborhood councils do some really great things. And so we'd like to uh, quickly take all that we learned um, the neighborhood councils are already doing and then see if we can uh, pollinate, if you will. So we're gonna do two things. On the 5th, which is Thursday, we're going to do an outreach boot camp, and that'll be at, um, in uh, North Hollywood. And there we're going to talk about just the basics of outreach. Uh, what's your story? Who your, who's your audience? Um, you know, how are you going to reach them? Uh, what are the tools that you're going to focus on? So some basic steps. And then um, on the 19th, um, also in the Valley in Encino, We'll be doing the Tux boot camp, which is a technology and user experience. And that's where we dial in specifically on the tools. Um, so it's, there's your outreach, your, your general outreach strategy, and then the very specific tools uh, that you would use, whatever you choose. And everyone seems to have a different, uh, the woman earlier mentioned that she loves them all. But you don't have to be all things to all people all the time. You should just pick a few things and do them really well, and whatever they are. Uh, we'll have sort of that menu of uh, technology that's available, and then user experience strategies, so you can frame things from the perspective of what your audience is um, um, uh, open to, what, what works in your particular community. You know, in the um, Foothill Trails, you know, they're a direct mail neighborhood simply because of the geographic um, nature of their, you know, you can't go door to door. Um, then, you know, Hector's neighborhood, you know, there's some great public events, and so, What's the strategy uh, for communicating? So those are the two events that are coming up. The Outreach Boot Camp on the 5th and the um, Tux Boot Camp on the 19th. We'll film both of them so that we can uh, make them available and we'll also take them on the uh, uh, tour of the city. It's just that we're going to start in the valley. Okay. What time and where? Um, the first one's in North Hollywood. Um, uh, yes. Um, it's uh, at 7063 Laurel Canyon, it's Fire Station 89 in North Hollywood, and it is at 7 o'clock. Yes. And the second one is the text train, the uh, social media train is on the 19th. That is at an Encino Community Center, I believe, on Balboa. It's near Ventura Boulevard. And uh, that one, I don't know what that one Seven o'clock also. Seven o'clock also. Commissioner Medina. Is there a flyer already, or is, it, is it a flyer going to be created and put it on the website? Uh, no, I think there's letters on the website. It'll be a flyer for you to download. Power related. Or? 
Um, any other comments? Uh, are you are you finished with your report? Thank one, you. I have one more comment. Oh, sure. Because some of these meetings sometimes we're a little bit more in the city and not in the valley. Sure, we're starting in the valley and then we're going to come uh, all the way around the circle. So we're kind of following. The valley was the first four regions that were seated, and some uh, some of the neighborhood councils haven't yet been seated in 9, 10, 11, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we're kind of working our way around chronologically as the as so the board is settling. Oh, the boot camp can come around, and as the new board is you know settling, uh, getting settled in, it was one of the first tools we made in front of it. Uh, may I suggest that you film the train? Yeah, we're gonna with uh, with one of your guys. Yeah, we're gonna be uh, videotaping both the um, both sessions, but also available for folks who can't come over the weekends. Is there a schedule already for the other series? No. So it's not scheduled for the rest of the regions. Yes. And so we're wide open because whenever a neighbor council wants to host it, it makes it even better if we can fit it in with something else that's going on. Or if a region wants to make it a regional thing and get behind it, it's just a double outreach planning. Technical term planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it sounds like there's some great enthusiasm on the commission for this issue, so we look forward to partnering awesome. with you on that. Um, is that you, Commissioner Medina? Yeah, I, I have a question for our general manager. Um, that uh, meeting is going to be on uh, June 9th at, uh, to talk about pretty much at the briefing meeting. Are we also, besides of that meeting, are we collecting best practices, what we're working on, and putting it together on a spreadsheet or something like that? Hey, please put me in for outreach or just for elections? Elections. Yes, we're, 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 yeah, we're going to look at um, what, what, what works and what needs to work better. Great. Any other commission comment before I open it up to public comment? Uh, okay, uh, Lee Wallach. Uh, and I'm going to call the other one so you can start coming up. Scott Johnson and Pete Nicholas. Hello, thank you for uh, having us here today. Um, I voted today. I actually take our rights as citizens here in the U.S. and our voting rights very seriously. I think most of the folks here do as well. Um, unfortunately, in the Palms area, Region 11, we had some real problems. And I don't think it was situated just in the Palms area as I start talking to other people around the city. Um, we were very involved. I had the Motor Avenue Improvement Association. We were very involved in the election. Um, we asked for after the election because we had made many concerns and still have not received any calls back from the GM. Uh, if there are election irregularities, we feel that this is pretty important stuff. We feel that we should have the kind of immediate response uh, that is dictated by such unfortunate circumstances. If you look at our timeline, May 18th, we had our elections. May 19th, results were announced and on, put on the Dunn website. May 20th, Palm's Neighborhood Council announced those same results. May 22nd, Ms. Smith initiates a review of the ballots and conducts a recount of Palm's elections and other elections, and this changes the outcome for a race in Palm. On the 23rd, one day later, um, Mr. Smith contacts all the candidates with an email with the new outcome and announces the deadline for the challenge was hours away. That's not an appropriate amount of time, of course. And then on May 30th, uh, another email went out from Mr. Box with a recap and final cert certification. Uh, this election was, was, was decided by staff, period. And that's inappropriate. Um, that's not what we're trying to build here. Um, our election, uh, I call prior to the election, talked to Elisa personally and asked if there was going to be an instant runoff. The community was told no. That's not what occurred. We had an instant runoff. That really helped skew the election in and of itself. One of our races had a tie. Well, by the rules, it should have been decided by drawing straws. Is that the best way to do it? I don't know, but that's what's in the rules. It was a tie. The third person on this ballot shouldn't have even been there. If there was going to be a recount, they should, in the rules that is written, they should be notifying community members for a public recount. Staff did what they wanted. 
They did not follow the rules, their own rules and policies and procedures. I ask all of you to read those rules. Just because it's not written doesn't mean that staff can then go and do a recount themselves. Nowhere have I ever seen any recount done behind closed doors in any election anywhere. I urge you folks to look at this. I urge you to think about whether the staff should be doing elections with other election professionals in the city. The integrity is all we have in this process, and that's very, very important. And I think we're kind of blowing it off at this point. Thank you. That's Pat Johnson. Good evening again. It's not just to know that as we get further and further into the summer months, we're going to be one neighborhood council pretty well up on those opposite efforts, and that's going to be LA 32. I want to read something from the Eastern Republication regarding our last election, and it's a quote from our former president, Connie Cattrall, regarding the accomplishment of the outgoing neighborhood council. The LA 32 neighborhood council recently sponsored a fourth annual El Cerrito Pie Festival at Ascot Hills Park to celebrate her day. And LA 32, the district two member candidate form, and the El Cerrito Farm Day of Healthy Start and Keep Owing program. All three of those events, two of those events, were officially sponsored by this neighborhood council. The first one mentioned, the LA 32 Pie Festival, could not be sponsored by the neighborhood council because we were on exhaustive efforts. But as the comment shows from the ex-president, it went ahead and was printed in a newspaper or record. It goes to show that, in my opinion, the actions taken by the employees of the department were suggestive and not objective. There was a public record request put in to the department, which was never fully responded to, based upon an email from the city council member's staff, who the authorities have basically said that the neighborhood council was invited to be a part of the event vis-a-vis Connie Castro and the city of Barubias, department employee, NEA. What we have to do here is, when we put these sanctions on upon an elected body, it needs to be based upon objective facts and not email changes that leave a gray area, especially when we're dealing with First Amendment rights. To put a neighborhood council on a soft set effort based solely on comments back and forth via email between board members and the slight impression that there could have been some sort of other connotations involving harassment or other issues, it's basically something that needs to have the criteria put in place before those suggestive measures are taken. I'm sorry to say, but again, LA 32 was suggested to a punitive action based upon emails. Now, later on this evening, we're going to get into dialogue about the appropriateness and professionalism of email between board members. And that'll be a great moment to have a teachable exercise on this. I'm in the past gone and sent some of those emails to board members. But also, I'd like to say real quick, as my time wraps up, Mr. Lipman made a very good choice about elections. And the fact is, in our election process, and I'm going to be point blank, when you have an IEA, Jay Handel, yelling at community members to impulse his will, how the election is to be dictated, and that person is not fit to be conducting the elections. Thank you. Pete Nichols. Good evening. My name is Pete Nicholas. I'm a residential stakeholder of the Rampart Village Neighborhood Council. And I don't rise to accuse anybody of anything or to complain about anything. I'd like to suggest an improvement for the next cycle of elections. And that is this. One of the problems elections cause is there are a huge expense. If we are actually on two-year cycles, they're going to occur every other year. Um, they're going to jerk the budget and the finances of neighborhood councils around greatly. Currently, the only funds going into escrow from 
neighborhood councils are for either budget advocates or for the Congress of Neighborhood Organizations, and people have been flirting this year with some kind of uh, escrow account that I'm not sure is going to work. There should be a process whereby in each year, not just in the year of the election, a neighborhood council can reserve some of its funds for the cost of elections. It was alluded to earlier how much of the money was remaining in the last portion of the fiscal year, and that was very much a function of the fact that people had to preserve their funds to be able to hold an election. There are some electronically oriented neighborhood councils that don't have to mail and don't have to print and don't have to have meetings and don't have expenses, but most of them do. And the board working with Dunn has two years now, assumedly, before the next election. And I urge you to figure out a way that out of each annual uh, budget, neighborhood council, uh, councils can put into escrow funds to be used for the every other year election process so that funding is, is more even and natural. In my own council, I tried to convince the powers to be to, in one year, buy all our supplies ahead and make the investments and get everything done so the next year we could have the election. But uh, it's hard with a bunch of volunteers and changing boards to get people to exercise the discipline of loading purchases that way, and it really didn't work out. But I just encourage you to examine this issue that every other year there's going to be a huge financial whack because we all know every neighborhood council is a pauper. We aren't recognized uh, adequately by the city, and neither the mayor recommends nor the city council adopts budgets that are adequate for a true empowered process. But living within the budgets we have, let's devise before the next election a process so that next fiscal year some funds can go into an account to be used the following year for the election process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to number seven, which is the opportunity for more of the East Area Neighborhood Councils to come up and speak with us. And so for this item, I'm going to turn it over to our commission uh, representative um, on the East Side, Olivia Rubio, who will um, call up the Neighborhood Council. Welcome, everybody, audience, fellow commissioners to El Cerrito Senior Center. We should have been at the beginning of this meeting. <laughs> and I am thrilled for Don to host our commission meeting here in the East area. Uh, it is an honor to represent the East and the Northeast, but I'm homegrown, and I am really, I am really committed to the movement of the Neighborhood Council System. One of the biggest rooms in this world is a room for improvement. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> And I see quite a bit in the audience. I see ongoing, long-standing, proactive community leaders from different areas. I see Highland Park, El Cerrito, Ellen 32, I refer to the NC name, <laughs> um, Boyle Heights, I, Rampart. I see quite a mix. Call it out. <laughs> and definitely, they can like the Father's Creek neighboring. <laughs> and I. And I see newly elected as well. And I would like to encourage you to step up and share any tried and true um, outreach strategy that your NC might have tried, or any experimental, innovative approaches that you might have explored. And I'm a strong believer we're headed to a different world. And if we only open our minds and hear each other out and try different ways and learn from those experiences. And this section allows for that forum for us to share that. And um, I'd like to encourage you to come up and share anything your NC has tried and worked out or turned out, turned out to be something more rich of a learning experience than you expected. Hector, come on up. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio and the uh, Commission and Casey and Joe. My name is Hector Wesso. I'm currently the chair of the Alliance of River Communities, which is Alliance for 14 neighborhood councils in the east and northeast area of Los Angeles, and uh, formerly uh, first vice president of the Historic Highland Park Neighborhood Council. 
Um, I want to um, share with you all uh, an event that we had this Saturday uh, that the Alliance um, hosted for, uh, particularly for new board members, but we also invited uh, stakeholders and, um, and uh, existing you know, activists in the area to participate and learn more about the New York Council system. Um, it was uh, informed by various members that were part of the Alliance, and we called it a crash course because uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to share some information with, with folks that uh, we all as an Alliance thought um, uh, should have been shared with us when we started and would have got us off on the right foot uh, to begin doing our work as uh, neighborhood council leaders. So um, I brought with me um, a sample of the uh, presentation and as well as uh, some board resource sheets that I'll share with you um, when, when I conclude. But uh, just to share a couple of highlights, we had 42 attendees from Region 7 and 8 and neighborhood councils. About 90% of them were uh, first time neighborhood council board members, first time electeds. Um, in this room, we have some attendees. Alejandro Cortez is newly elected um, and, and first time uh, president of the Greater Cypress Park uh, Neighborhood Council and other activists and board members. Uh, I think America Lopez is joining us, a gentleman from Silver Lake who was at the meeting as well. So um, it was definitely well attended and uh, the feedback I got was well received. Um, we pretty much covered um, four main areas uh, that we thought would be useful to neighborhood councils. Uh, the first being explaining the um, existing formal city structure that supports the neighborhood councils that the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners is, is a part of, that the uh, Committee on uh, Education and Neighborhoods is a part of, and explaining what their roles are, that the department is a part of, explaining uh, what their roles are, how they support neighborhood councils, and um, working in partnership with that, we also explain the informal structure of neighborhood councils. Uh, the Los Angeles Alliance of Neighborhood Councils, which is led by neighborhood council leaders. The Budget Advocates, which is led by neighborhood council leaders. And all the various uh, area um, alliances and regional alliances that exist throughout the city. Um, I want to, at this point, give a particularly uh, heartfelt thank you to uh, Commissioner Lydia Grant, who uh, enhanced the presentation. Uh, she was there in attendance for the first half, and she lent a lot of information to the new board members, uh, as well as some um, words of um, encouragement and inspiration. Um, and, you know, um, with the feedback that I received from this, uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged to um, uh, offer it up to other uh, regions or neighborhood councils, and I've um, started a conversation with uh, uh, Lark Galloway in South Los Angeles with Slank, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that maybe uh, since I was the IEA in South Los Angeles, and uh, we both have a network of folks, we can get uh, neighborhood council leaders together for something similar uh, there as well. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave some materials for you all to check out. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions about the experience, but I think it was very positive, and um, I can invite people to come and uh, sort of talk about it a little bit if they'd like to. Um, but overall, I think it was um, the uh, uh, sort of labor-intensive effort. I think it was very well received and very positive, and I've already received some really good feedback from people on how to make it um, even better, even more informative. Um, I should also mention that it included um, a, a broad overview, overview of how to run effective meetings um, that, that uh, I think people could take back and use right away. And it also included a conversation of sort of how neighborhood councils um, may want to consider how to uh, do a sort of self-assessment, how to evaluate themselves, things like, you know, are, are, you, are you using your funds wisely or is it just a huge spend down at the end of the year? Are you really submitting uh, community impact statements? and responding to the work that um, uh, our paid elected officials are doing and things like that. So um, thank you for the time. I'm going to leave this uh, with Joe for all you all to kind of share and check out. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so Ms. Hammer. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. First of all, for those of you who are in the room that attended, I want to thank you for stepping up. Um, it's hard enough to be a new neighbor and council leader, but to put aside the time for extra training just shows how dedicated that you are. And to all the work that Hector obviously put into this, it was amazing. I was so excited about it when I got the PowerPoint 
sent to me that I was forwarding it out to other neighborhood council leaders because I, I just thought it was it was great. I, I was really proud of it. I know I even had talked to some of the people in the department about what a great job I thought you had done. So I want to thank you for stepping up and doing that for your community. Thank you guys for holding this, and I just wanted to ask um, if anybody has had any experiences, positive or negative, or being legal, to record with a simple iPhone that's widely available your meetings and post them in a way so that everybody, stakeholders, can easily access the uh, information that's going on in their neighborhood council because I think it's very available and a um, uh, really easy thing for us to think about doing. Um, I've done it on my own. I'm not even sure it's legal. But um, YouTube and uh, live streaming would be great. And I've talked to someone at the Tech LA conference about that. But just posting it um, is one idea I want to bring up. Thank you. Is he with the neighborhood council? I'm with, yeah, I'm with the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood council. Oh, which one? Oh, oh great. Perfect. Uh, Super Lake. He's the chief information. I mean, like, they, oh, at the park. Great to even have a chief information officer at my neighborhood council. Love oh, it. <laughs> Too is that 
if we do not utilize the brain trust of fellow neighborhood council members who have been in the system for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, then in order to progress to the next level, those mentors that have to be brought in on their own volition to empower new neighborhood council people to reach their maximum potential. What I'm advocating is that the, the commission here and the leadership of the department needs to empower council for council and help work with them to create a mechanism to train future mentors among the neighborhood, neighborhood council activists within the city of Los Angeles and set them loose to work with the newbies to go on their to grow them and to empower them to be the best community leaders they could, they could part, you know, become. In this room here, I can point out, I can point out the brain trust in this community, Mr. Tom Williams. You see Mr. Tom Williams always at our city hall meetings. Okay? He has his favorite seat up there in the third row. Okay? If you want to talk about DWP issues or Caltrans issues, talk to Mr. Williams. Mr. McGuire. His wife, Linda McGuire, was one of the founding members of this neighborhood council of this community. Mr. Hugo Pacheco, people can't, you know, forget that he was a Lincoln Heights neighborhood council president one time. Okay? Mike Roseberry, said you mentioned Hugo Pacheco. Mike Roseberry is one of those ground founders that is always going to come out and back you up when you need to get people involved in community events. It's imperative that if we're going to grow the neighborhood council system, we have to retain our, our brain trust. We have to retain our mentors. And we have to create an organized body to put those mentors to use. Council for Council is a great endeavor to move that forward. I want to keep my comments positive. I know there's some compartment employees who unfortunately may not feel too empowered with them being involved. But in order to maintain the growth, we create a sustainability neighborhood council system. Mentors like the ones in our community and throughout the city need to be empowered and there has to be a structure mechanism to get them out there, set them loose, to create the new mentors of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I just want to make sure that we're clear in this section that we're talking about what's happening at the neighborhood council. So hopefully that's what you all are planning on talking about. And then we have another general public comment on item number 10, if your comment is more general than talking about what's happening with your neighborhood council. So um, I've just been reminded that we need to get speaker cards on everybody. So if you haven't done a speaker card on this item and you spoke or you're about to speak, please do fill out a speaker card. Um, I, I know that I see Anthony Mazzano standing up there, so you can, yeah, why don't you come on up and speak. Thank you once again, Commissioners. My name is Anthony Manzano, living in the community of Rose Hills, served here by LA32 Neighborhood Council. Uh, some of the best practices for our community is uh, something that Mr. Johnson had mentioned, is using the experience from previous board members. Some of the things that we've encouraged in the past is getting out there and taking active measures and cleaning our streets. We are probably one of the first neighborhood council city-wide to have every single fire hydrant painted by the beautification committee because our volunteers were out there being productive and taking measures uh, and providing uh, inspiration to other stakeholders. I'd like to encourage maybe a spelling bee from our neighborhood council. I'd like to encourage the Beneficial Improvement Recycling Program that I created. I'd like to also encourage um, more other uh, neighborhood council members throughout the city to do a walk the block. It creates a safer streets at night program. But I'd also like to encourage the board members to recognize milestones because every neighborhood council has one. A five year anniversary, a 10 year anniversary, something up, coming up great in the community. But these milestones are important to every stakeholder. Relating to what the a document that was sent out to you guys, uh, aside from just popular things, is on the back, it gives ideas of uh, what was it, best practices or embraces the goal of engaging community members. Number one, it says how many seats are on your board and how many seats are vacant. 
does the board reflect the diversity of stakeholders in your neighborhood council area? Right now, as I spoke a little bit earlier, that answer is no, because in our bylaws, it states that the South Region, which is University Hills, as part of a governing board, must be composed of four seats. During our election, we didn't have those four seats filled. But like I mentioned earlier, I have over 70 stakeholder initiative petitions asking that item to be placed on the agenda. So as part of the process, we, we've heard here that even if the rule says to pull straws, you do what the rules say. I have followed the rules. The rules in our bylaws says the governing board must contain 21 board members, and we're not there yet. The people have spoken, and they have pages and pages and pages of signatures indicating that they want this item on the agenda. So the whole idea is encourage the stakeholders, follow the rules, use the experience that we have out there. There's doctors, there's lawyers, there's plumbers, there's uh, uh, other people that are involved in um, business and more importantly involved in politics. I'm just a neighbor, but I've been doing this for 10 years and I have a lot of good ideas to influence the neighborhood councils to still be productive, progressive, and the word change, yes, but we have to progress, not change, because change can be detrimental. And one last note, they said they want to include everybody as part of this information that I'll be submitting a little bit later. They held an executive committee meeting and I got emails that not even all executive members were invited. That's called exclusion. And if we want inclusiveness, we bring everybody to the table. The board members, the commissioners, the community, and hopefully this item will be placed on the agenda. Let the people be heard and just fill our board to 21 seats and that will assist in more grievances. Thank you so much. Thank you. system is going to work. 
It has to be independent. It cannot be at the last minute bringing a bunch of people, whether it be outsider, senior citizens, whatever, just because that's the way the councilman wants the election to go. Now, people could say, oh, no, you're making these things up. Ah, I've been there. I've seen it happen. Now, one of the things that I kept asking, on the final tally of votes, on the final tally of votes, it has to change. And yet I know because the family member only voted for myself and one other person, those provisional votes were never counted votes. It's still the same as it was that night of the vote. Something is wrong. The other thing is, how can you tell me that I'm going to serve two years on this board and cut me six months off? We six months short. There's something wrong with the whole system. But unless people open up and be like Abraham Lincoln and really believe in the system and fight for the system, the system, the democratic system, this is for not, folks. It's a joke. Thank you. Six dollars per person, so it's kind of a difficult thing. 
But we need a much better system of getting the departments to, like DWP and supposedly the Board of Public Works, have memorandum of agreements so that we can cooperate at a much better level. Thank you. Great. So, um,
the training issue um, as it relates to how um, neighborhood council members treat um, their fellow board members, stakeholders, and other people in the community. Before we have that conversation, I'm just, Commissioner, do you want to stand up and just take a little stretch break? I don't want to stop because we have to leave here shortly, but, but let's take a little stretch.
we're so appreciative to have you here this evening to have this conversation with us about, um, I guess we could say the climate at neighborhood councils. Someone talked earlier about the fact that, um, you know, everybody's volunteering. And so the ideal is that, you know, you have a positive experience um, as a volunteer. And so um, we really want to support, um, you know, addressing what we're hearing from the field in terms of people treating each other um, in a way that is, um, you know, negative and, you know, just, just fuels um, a lot of bad feelings. And so we, over the next few months, um, want to have a conversation with the neighborhood councils to, um, you know, talk about uh, what's happening and to, to get that input in support of developing a policy around the issue. I don't know if you want to say a couple of words, Commissioner Schaefer, about what's happening in terms of the policy development process so people have a sense of, um, you know, what exactly we're looking at at this point. Well, basically, um, our committee has looked into this. Um, the two of us, um, myself and Commissioner Grant, originally had a meeting with uh, City Council Member Martinez, Mary Martinez, who introduced a motion with regards to this issue. Um, thereafter, um, there was some um, action by the city with regards to some complaints, and the focus moved from where it had been to where we are going now. And that is issues involving what are called bullying or harassment. I refer to as bad behavior. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop some guidelines for neighborhood councils as to one, what kind of training, or I like to put it education, but we use the term training, should neighborhood council members have that makes them aware um, of certain things with regards to their actions. In other words, some of us may do things that we don't think are offensive to others, but in fact they are. And so what we'd like to do is find some type of mechanism for educating people basically to, what is it that, that you, know, you should or should not be doing? And once we get through that, once a person's aware of, of the parameters of, of their actions, or what they should or shouldn't be doing, what happens when they act out anyway? What happens when they engage in this bad behavior, even after knowing how things should be? And for that, we're looking to give, or hope to give, to neighborhood councils, or perhaps a request the department to help, um, the ability to do something with regards to members of their board that not only have a problem interacting with board members, in other words, there's bullying of board members, but how they interact with stakeholders. There's bullying of stakeholders, there's harassment, there's inappropriate behavior towards stakeholders. Uh, to that end, um, we're looking at a lot of ideas. Um, we've got a um, proposed um, policy, and that's all it is, is proposed, it's a draft. It's something we put out there to start the conversation that says, okay, here's what you're not supposed to do. Not definitively. In other words, we're not trying to define what is bullying, what is harassment, what is this bad behavior that we've heard about. Not all neighborhood councils. We've got neighborhood councils that, that everybody gets along. Um, as they say, you can disagree without being disagreeable. Even if you are a little bit disagreeable once in a while, it's not the kind of conduct that we've heard about neighborhood councils around the city. 
some of which is rather surprising, um, to say the least. Um, so that, that's, that's for another time and place to actually define it. That's what the, the training would be for, perhaps an integration of some kind into this proposal that says these are the kind of things that we're looking at. These are generally the kind of things that you should not be doing. Um, and um, we want to get from neighborhood councils. We want to get from just average neighborhood, well, neighborhood council people aren't average. They're above average because they're volunteers and they put out their time. We want to get your thoughts, your ideas um, with regards to this proposal or another proposal that may be brought up because of these discussions as things are refined. We'd like to see what you think about these. Uh, do you think they'd be helpful? Do you think uh, um, neighborhood councils should engage in this type of education? Do you think board members should be given the authority to perhaps remove members of the board, elected members of the board, as, as other legislative bodies can do oftentimes, if they do not stop certain actions after being warned and told and such as that. So that's where we are. Commissioner Schaefer, would you um, maybe summarize the, po I mean, it's, I don't know that we should go through every line, but if you could summarize the policy so that people have a sense about what we're talking about here, and then Commissioner Grant. Basically, with, with the proposed policy, the says that we know it exists. We'd like to stop this bullying and this, this, this bad behavior. And um, we're going to give people 90 days from the time they become board members to take training that we hope will be developed by the uh, by the department. Perhaps um, our good friends of the city attorney's office will help. Um, and um, if you don't do it within 90 days. We want to give the tools to your board to say, hi, you're off the board. You, you, you can't stay here anymore. You, you can't bother to take this training. And during that, that time, uh, you can't engage in activities with the board. In other words, if your board is making decisions, you don't get to vote on those decisions. You don't have to discuss them after a certain point in time because you haven't taken the training. Um, then, if you do take the training, and um, you continue to ignore how you're supposed to act. Your board can take action against you up to and including having you removed and booting you off because you just can't act properly within the uh, uh, At the same time, if something's going on and the board's not doing anything, the stakeholder has the ability to complain to the department and say, hey, nothing's happening here. It should be happening. And the department, if they so desire, can step in and say to the board, hi, you guys need training in this specific area because you're not recognizing these problems. Or to a board member, you need more training in this specific area. At the same time, it could be the subject of a grievance under our new grievance policy because it'll be part of your bylaws. And other neighborhood council members could judge whether or not you're doing anything or should be doing something. Um, and the ultimate, obviously, would be what we call exhaustive efforts. And hopefully the city council is going to um, end up doing something that the commission has recommended, the working groups the commission has had out there recommended. And that is short of decertification, involuntary decertification, the um, department will be able to come to the commission and say, as part of exhaustive efforts, the board should be removed because they're not doing anything to solve this problem, even though they have the ability to do so. And uh, that's basically what this proposed policy, this, this first outline, talks about. Yes, um, a couple things. One, what I would like to hear from the um, public on isn't so much what types of things that you've experienced or seen, because we know that it's out there. If you spend half of your time talking about what you've seen and are experienced, we're not going to have as much dialogue from you of the ideas and changes that you think need to take place. 
So when you get up there, first of all, I'd love to hear what your council you're from. Not all of you have said that, or many of you haven't spoken yet. So it's really important that we hear from you. Also, yes, I have experienced the bullying. State bullying. We have had, had problems with it on our council. My ideas are, or we like that you're doing this. Because that way we don't spend the whole evening getting, frankly for me, as many stories as I've heard, getting stressed out hearing all the stories. We're trying to fix it. We want you to be part of helping us fix the problem. So I just wanted to say that before you got up to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, our first speaker is Alejandra Cortez. And you'll have about two minutes. I have about 13 speaker cards up here, so we've got a lot to get through by 9.15. Sure. Commissioner. Commissioner Medina. Uh, I just want to say one thing. As you guys come up, and this is, again, this is just a draft. I do want to emphasize, though, you might be thinking in yourself and your head right now, well, we volunteers, he goes another training, another thing. Keep in mind, though, if you're not the person causing this trouble, all we're asking for you is just to take the simple video, and then the poly, you will never see it, never see that video, you will never hear that about that issue. So it's just a quick, quick another thing, but again, keep in mind, if you're not the person causing the trouble, you won't have to continue to do this kind of uh, training. So it's only one time thing. So, hi, my name is Alejandro Cortez, and I'm the new president of the Greater Cypress Park Neighborhood Council. I recently found out about the council. I didn't even know it existed in my 24 years living in Cypress Park. And when I first started attending the meetings, I, I noticed this conflict right away, just as a stakeholder, how uh, this was happening. And so, um, I, I got elected, and so now that I'm the challenge that I'm going to see that hopefully I will come account since nine out of the four members, three are returning. So it's like a kind of a fresh start of kind of trying to set the standard. And so I feel that in the past years, the reason why our council hasn't been efficient is because the meetings aren't efficient, because these people are going off on tantrum or like going off to stakeholders. And so if the meetings are not efficient, um, Nothing is being done, and no outreach is being done, so nothing is being efficient, like I said. So I think this could be a policy that can serve as a tool, and an extra tool, but can also be served as a weapon. So it's just making sure that the people are educated about this issue of like knowing exactly what it is and not feeling blindsided about the issue. And so a recommendation that I can give, I can give is like having a retreat or requiring some sort of retreat. So the board members can not only get to know each other, but also understand these policies because a lot of people are coming back from different backgrounds, ages, experiences. So they just come and show up to meetings and not know how to function as a team. And so I feel like that's allowing this room for this disagreement and bullying. And I know my neighborhood better than you do, and you're just coming on in. And so I'm kind of also talking about a little bit about my fears, but <laughs> I'm definitely like willing up to use I'd be willing to put, implement this in my neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Manzano. I'm going to call a few of you up so we can go to the people. Scott Johnson, Dr. Tom Williams. Good evening, commissioners. Again, my name is Anthony Manzano, a stakeholder at this moment. Uh, served by the Alec Thurston Neighborhood Council. I'm a resident of the community of Rose Hills, and I think uh, as my public comment card indicates, I'm in favor of something like this, but there's just a little bit of things that you, you have to consider. I, I don't have all the answers, they don't have all the answers, not even people in downtown have all the answers. But the basic reason for applying these uh, principles is to protect the city from violation. That's what the trainings are for, to protect the city. Now the whole idea is when you're protecting the city, you offer these trainings and make sure we're following the rules, the bylaws, Brown Act postings, Robert's Rules of Order. But I think a good thing that you guys could implement was also do a background check, perhaps. Because if by chance you're saying, you know what, these people are the ones causing trouble. But if you go back and you find out that they have a criminal background, then you've already initiated the problem by putting them on the board, and I have to find a way to get them off. So I would probably suggest these trainings. Item number two, it says if the member fails to complete the training within 60 days, definitely accept something like that, because everyone has to take these trainings. But more importantly, just within 60 days, Ask them to take this training before they even apply as a candidate, because that shows their level of of, of not, uh, uh, their level of participation that they really want to do this. 
you know what? If you really want to be on the board, then go take the class. Oh, well, I don't want to take the class. I'm not on the board yet. If you want to be on the board, go take the class. It's just a simple guideline that's saying you are committed. Number four indicates exactly what Mr. Schaefer was saying as the commissioner, that removal of this would be 90 days. Absolutely, because if you're not taking this training, then you're really not being a benefit to the community, and you're not uh, being a service to the community. You're just filling a seat. But I want to go down to number six really quick on the same document that you guys have before you. I think it's a little light to have three members say, we don't want you on here. Our board consists of 21 board members, and to have three, some would just say, hey, you know what, it's me and you and him. There's three right there. Our bylaws specifically indicate that if you want to do something like this by removing a board member, our threshold is nine. Only because it's just shy of our quorum. But three, I think it's just a little bit soft. Thank you. I would definitely support something like this. Just encourage all the potential neighborhood council candidates to take the training. Thank you so much. Thank you. Scott Johnson. Uh, Hugo Pacheco. My first thought is that uh, in dealing with these type of issues and dealing with with the human element that come up with dealing with contentious issues, the American experiment is full of great great illustrations and great teaching tools from history how to deal with things. One of the things I think that's on is the great style of the 1850 compromise when you have people like Henry Clay, Samuel Webster, and John Calhoun come up with a compromise dealing with the partition of American states in 1850. Very contentious issues. Unfortunately, 10 years, decade later, some of those issues have led us to a great divide in this country. But on a micro level, we're dealing with policy here. We're making a policy designed by human beings to regulate human beings. And what we have to do here is we need to make sure that this document, the photograph of this document, is an adjustive tool to regulate conduct. I've been on the receiving end of the tax from people, the emails that the department used to justify the exhaustion efforts against our MC will show that. But that's part of First Amendment rights. Now, is it is it okay to be attacked? No. But it comes, where do we draw the line about protecting the First Amendment? In dialogue. Okay? Is it a First Amendment right to be called xenophobic? Unfortunately, yes. Is it a First Amendment right to be called racist? Unfortunately, yes. It's repugnant, but yet you have people out there who will use that in order to try to sway you or to attack you when you're trying to, present, trying to present a policy or a position based upon objective reasoning. I would like, again, to see this document incorporate the brain trust of the neighborhood council system. We need a mentor board, a group of first responders, to use that term, who could be used to intervene in disputes involving personnel on a given board. They're underutilized. Once again, our brain trust is there. You can bring in a panel. It's kind of like a peer review. You're working for LAPD and you're facing termination, for example. I was the union steward at one time on a deck of Julie Butcher for Local 347 at CIU. And one of the things you have to do is when you address these type of grievances, these types of workplace concerns, or in this case, neighborhood council issues, you need to have an objective process. That takes out the politics. It takes out the, per the, the personal, the, the personal, um, uh, the personal issues involved, and make it a, a document that will be uniform in growing the objective professionalism in the neighborhood council body. Can you, would you mind wrapping up? Yes. Once again, the key thing here is for this to work, we need not to rely on the five or six NEAs that have to work with 90 neighborhood towns in Los Angeles, in order to really make this go places, the mentors who are the volunteers who want to get involved have to be an integral part of this process. And they have to be on call, and we need to have a panel in place. When these grievances come forward, we have to have a first, a first responder group set aside to intervene to keep our NC from going to the last resort, which is called exhausted efforts and decertification. Thank you. Thanks. 
You got the table. I'm going to address my comments to the draft itself, if you would mind. And uh, whereas it says here, it's based upon association with another person who has or is perceived to have such a characteristic. Folks, I have a lot of friends. As a real estate broker, I deal with everybody. The law says that all I have to do is look at another person, the color green. That's it. And so there's people that I know are bullies. Does that mean that I'm a bully because I know those people and I might talk to them? That's got to be careful with some of this language. The other thing that I'm, I'm looking at here is sending communications or telephoning a board member after being asked to stop. You know, I was involved in a very successful campaign to stop the, uh, the 7-Eleven in Lincoln Heights to get their liquor license. Excuse because me. It was I'm sorry. Can you um, specify which draft you're referring to? Oh, I'm sorry, but I believe it's a resolution draft. Agenda number eight, prohibition against bullying and harassment between neighborhood council board members. I mean, I don't know what else. Okay, um, are we on the right one now? No, no, do you want to make sure she's got the right one? I picked it up from there, <laughs> so I have no idea. I mean, I'm, I just read this one. Yeah. Is this the one we're talking about? Is this the one I'm supposed to address? Yeah, oh, okay. All right, thank you. Sending communications on um, telephone or telephone to a board member after being asked to stop. The community of Lincoln Heights was being manipulated through the neighborhood council to allow the city of to be able to get a liquor license. I was able to get the community involved and be able to tell the neighborhood council members that we did not want that liquor license in a gang infested area. But okay. well, one of the board members who happens to come out on, on the internet with his rifle and kind of in an intimidating way sent me an email saying, we took care of you the last time, I don't want you to ever send me another email. Folks, I just, all I did is I just went ahead and copied him. That's all I did. So based on this, I might be violating this policy. Right? Because he would say, don't send me anything else. But I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to do what anybody would do is let everybody know. I don't know what you want to know if you're part of the neighborhood council, the communications that I'm having with anybody. And then here on item number three, depending on the number and severity of complaints filed against a board member, Who's going to determine the severity? I ask myself, who's determining that? And I mean, if it was my dad, my dad would hit me if I would call somebody stupid. I mean, to him, that was a cuss word. Is that severe? Who decides that? Here's the other one. Is this a specific process? This is, I'm going down to item number 3B. And it says, admonishment, training, temporary suspension, expulsion from the board. My problem is not so much with the neighborhood council being able to regulate themselves. I've got a problem with Dunn. The way Dunn right now is administered, I'd be a little afraid to have them in the West. You okay. might wrap up, please. Okay, one more thing. There is a provision in the bylaws. The current bylaws that are used by most uh, neighborhood councils, and that is a censure. You censure somebody first. That's that's bylaws and that's also Robert's Rules of Order. When that person is, not, is, is censured, that's the first step. Second step is the recall system. We have a system. All we need to define is what bullying and harassment is. There's already a system to take care of problems like this. Thank you. Um, thank you. This is wonderful. I really appreciate the steps that, uh, that you all are taking on this topic. Um, there is a real need for training um, and on appropriate behavior and effective ways to work with community to respectfully uh, respond and interact with those who elected them and ultimately those, the people that they work for, which sometimes these you know, folks forget. 
Um, we, we just had a council me a member resign before he was even seated due to harassment and some serious harassment and intimidation by our president-elect. Uh, I have experienced it. Uh, film, follow, put on websites, slander uh, by our incoming president. It, 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 it's, a, it's a really tough issue in a lot of in a lot of neighborhood councils. Um, you know, what I really like to see is some training, and, and maybe something more in the video, but some training. Uh, maybe Mrs. Mack could uh, to do this herself. Uh, it takes a real art to, to be able to handle folks. Uh, I have to admit, it's not easy. But that's the job that folks sign up for. And I've seen some tough situations, like city council members, commission members, you know, but they signed on to this. So they have to have some ability to handle these folks respectfully. I would also finally, I would also add a recall, you know, process for the community as well. Um, uh, so if the, if the community feels that this person needs to go, that they are able to do that, um, I wholly support uh, that board members should be able to uh, vote a, a, a member off the island, so to speak. Uh, I would also add that if this member has other family members, colleagues, or others intimidating on their behalf, that's we're seeing that in our neighborhood as well. And I mean, it really is horrific at this point. Uh, if anybody would like to see the website, I'll be happy to. Uh, no news online. Feel free to go and see what we're dealing with. Um, no news online .com, You'll see from from ourselves, from some of your own members to the mayor. It's constant. So thank you for your work. Uh, Michelle Hernandez. Good evening, I'm Michelle Hernandez, LE32, President Treasurer. And I think this is great. I was reading it. It's going to do good. And the experience that I've experienced um, as a stakeholder, I attended the Finance Committee for LE32 February and March. And it was really, really sad to see how the former treasurer was bullying the committee member. You know, not only was he bullying her, it was also the recording secretary. And, and that's one of the reasons why I said, I'm going to join LE32 to make a difference. So those people that are sitting there bullying each other, it's not going to happen. You know, and, and this is perfect. This is great. This is going to help us so we don't treat each other like that, you know. And the same people that are the bullying ones are the same that keep coming up here and saying, fill the seats, fill the seats. Why would we want to fill? Are they going to follow this or are we, go are we going to be bullied? Now I'm scared. If they come on, will we be bullied by these that are holding on to something that, oh, well, we have years and years of being here, you know? Vices, vices can get you into trouble. And they've had vices that they've been used to, that they've been doing things that have their comfort that they can't see that the change is here. But this is something really great that I think will help, and uh, I wish this would, this would have been put to use back in February when that core committee member was really not, I mean, he only, bull not only did he bully her, but the stakeholder too. I mean, the stakeholder was, I, I was like, okay, and we recorded it. There is, you know, we got a tech guy who records this stuff all the time. I mean, that stakeholder, you know, she couldn't even speak. You know, he kept cutting her off. You know, cutting her before her minutes. It was just terrible. Really, really sad to see. And like I said, that encouraged me to to do this so I can demonstrate and show that you know we shouldn't be bullying each other or the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sharon Christie. Thank you, I'll try and keep within the two minutes. Uh, my name is Sharon Christie, and as I said, I'm a newly elected South Carthay representative to Pico Neighborhood Council uh, in District 5 and District 10. Uh, I also am now the new official secretary to the Pico Neighborhood Council. I am taking all condolences at this time. Um, <laughs> um, in the brief um, three meetings that I have attended in my neighborhood council, uh, I am happy to say that I have not witnessed any bullying of what I'm hearing um, here from other people. And 
What I would like to recommend is, you know, policy is a uh, somewhat onerous um, um, name when it comes forward. Um, if somebody's going to be a bully, they're still going to be a bully. And no piece of paper is going to be able to effectuate that change because it's just human behavior. What does that come from? It comes from a multitude of things, of frustration. Um, it, you know, any of you that were Girl Scouts, Brownies, um, Cub Scouts, it takes a spark to start a fire. And education is the water for the spark. The gentleman that recommended pre-education, learning about the neighborhood council, there's a multitude of things that um, are swimming around in my head in terms of solutions to affect change. Um, I would see the first thing that we call this policy is the guideline, a skill set for mindfulness. Because that is what it is that people need to have for one another. We are all volunteers, we all want to do good, we want to help, and we just need to be mindful of our differences and embrace our biodiversity. I had a wonderful uh, woman on my land committee. Uh, her name is Sue Bioman, and she, her background is human resources. I'm suggesting that we look at an outreach committee of neighborhood councils that have people with these skill sets. One of the things that I have no knowledge of in my Pico Neighborhood Council is what everybody does. What's the background? What can they contribute? They come, they go. They come, they go. Um, I want to know because I want to support their strengths, not their weaknesses. And I think all too often, those that have weaknesses, they are preyed upon. Uh, I am not a terrific speller. I have to then disqualify, disqualify myself to that. Um, you want to wrap up? Yes. So the point is that people have different strengths, and when their weaknesses are made to be in the forefront, that's when you have the spark, that's when you have the fire. Um, I think the individual people need to have training on how to deal with bad behavior. If there is, and I've witnessed in another meeting where somebody will start arguing amongst themselves and everybody else is listening. I stood up and I said, I think you need to take this out of the room. It is disruptive. People all looked around, how could you say that? Well, that's what everybody starts to have to do, is become the team member that they're not going to tolerate that. Why allow it? So, um, thank you. Thank you. Background check, I think, is extremely important. Thank you. Um, so any comments, commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Lipman? Oh. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to do it. Commissioner Lipman. Yes, so uh, first of all, I want to thank all the people who commented, and it sounds like there is a more positive opinion of this policy than negative, which is a little bit different than what I've been hearing from the West Side. I've gotten some some criticism, um, some just minor, but some more major. Uh, I mean, I, I want to continue to hear from folks. I have sort of made up my mind, but I would put this out to the members of the commission. Uh, three things. One is and this came up from one of my my stakeholders. What if the neighborhood council already has a pretty strong structure and better language than this? Are we sort of gutting and amending their language and their bylaws? Um, and so we need to come up with, are we, are we just talking about the neighborhood councils who don't have this in their bylaws? Or are we just talking across the board? And I, I, okay, so I'd wanna sort of clarify that and also recognize that some neighborhood councils have put in place some pretty good measures already. Um, and then the other issue that's come up you know, with me is, you know, this discouragement. If they sort of see this bevy of hours of training, will this discourage people from joining the neighborhood council system? And I, I am worried about that. One thing that I think is glaringly missing, glaringly missing in this is, where is the mediation alternative? 
There is nothing in here about trying to mediate bad behavior. And most of this is a dispute between two or a couple of individuals. And I think we really need to provide some structure for a mediation alternative. Now, could that be um, the city attorney as an alternative dispute resolution system, and how does that work, and is there funds for that? Or can we get volunteers? And I know C4C is sort of that, but it, it's not called that, and, and I don't necessarily know if the C4C folks have the training for mediation. Or could we get student mediators? Look, um, Pepperdine Law School has the best alternative dispute resolution program in the country. The second best, third best, one of them. One of the top three. Why can't we get student mediators to help mediate some of this bad behavior? And I think that should be the first step before we go into any of these punitive measures. And I do think we should have the punitive measures on bad behavior, but we also have to think about the alternative, which is how do we encourage good behavior? And let me just let that sink in a little bit. How do we provide training for good behavior? And I think some of the, the commenters said this, uh, the, the new president for um, Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln Park. Secretary, yes. Um, how do we provide training and assume we're assuming that people will do bad, but what's encouraging them to do good? How do we provide incentives to neighborhood councils to complete trainings on how to run a good meeting, how to work together, how to have a board that's inclusive and recognizes everybody's feelings? Because that's what, if we don't have that good behavior, that's what's going to lead to the bad behavior. So I, I want to see if we can kind of insert that into it as much as possible. Um, I, we're running out, quickly running out of time. I, I want to just say that, you know, we've got um, a lot more outreach to do, and I actually did a draft of some talking points because at the last meeting we said that we were going to um, go out to our neighborhood councils and actually go out to the alliances to um, have a conversation about this issue. So I'm hoping that um, you know we'll we'll take up the mantle. Um, does anybody just I'm just curious who has plans to go to any of the alliance meetings coming up? Okay, so you're going to go tomorrow.
you know, do our outreach process, our conversations, is having these two drafts. So how do you think, do you have a recommendation on how uh, to um, th that takes a whole conversation because the, the, the two drafts look at two different philosophies. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're going to have to. Work, work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I really feel like, I mean, so, you, so if you can provide us with some guidance on, you know, what we're, because, you know, it's a little bit confusing for us, and I think it's confusing for the public to have two versions, so... I don't want to get into the uh, off-the-record <laughs> Yeah, discussion. right. I, I will just say this very, very quickly so we get out. From, from my point of view, just my own point of view, um, one of the drafts um, that is from the city attorney's office looks towards the department as more or less the enforcer and, and such. Okay. Uh, and it looks towards action between board members, whereas the draft that we have been considering looks more towards the neighborhood councils as being the enforcers up to a point, right. and also looks at conduct between board members and members of the board. Okay. Okay, so we'll have to talk more about that. And I, I really apologize that, that I thought we had a little more time. And we did have some more speaker cards, but we have to vacate by 9 o'clock. So we, I want to just thank you all so much for coming out to our meeting and for giving us your input. And, um, you know, we look forward to hearing more input from you if you have it um, at future meetings through email and, you know, other channels of communication. So thank you very much. And can I have a motion to adjourn? No final call at 9. No, we can't because we have to leave at 9. Motion to, to adjourn? I have a commission. Well, I, I, I feel like it's probably not fair. So, so let's just adjourn. Sorry. So, motion to adjourn? Okay.